Oh my goodness, Anthony Melchiori, we're at the Garden City Hotel. We've got new gear and hopefully it's all going to go well today. I hope so, my friend. Happy Friday. <laughs> I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, man, it's good to see you. I love my windswept hair and that brand new intro that we got yeah, going on over there. Mine, too. Windswept right off my head. <laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome to No Vacancy with your host. We got uh, Anthony Melchiori right over there and me, Glenn Hausman. Very excited to see you. All right, so we're trying something new. We're trying to up our game because we really want to, Anthony, go out and do a lot more of these in-person things. So we're doing a great test run here over at the Garden City Hotel. And so far, not so bad. Yeah, we got new equipment. Uh, thanks, Enrique, our sound engineer. We have a sound engineer now, Enrique. That's unpaid. Uh, he has a couple Grammys, so he's uh, he's he's a real deal. He just got off the plane. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell who he's working with, but he's working with uh, an A-list uh, singer that he's been working with for a long time. I think his name's Ricky Martin, but I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you that. Well, and, yeah, and, you, you shouldn't then. And, I would not mention his name then. <laughs> Whatever you do, do not mention Ricky Martin's and, name. And um, anyway, he's, he, he's my sound guy on our show uh, when we were doing Hotel Impossible, and we'll be on my new show uh, when that happens. Right. Not quite. So um, today is a little bit different in the sense of – um, we're working with somebody, somebody's going to be on the show today that I work with. And I've worked with them now, I think, four months, five months. I don't remember how long exactly. Thank you, Curtis. But um, I will just tell you, the company is called Pharaohs. And I will let Rachel, uh, the young lady we're going to have on, talk through what they do. But basically, um, it's about helping college students and helping the um, executive team and teachers really communicate better and understand where uh, the children or the young adults are having concerns and issues. So she'll talk through the software. But through this relationship, I became really good friends with these people. And oh, yeah? I just absolutely, absolutely 100% love them both. And they make me laugh. And um, But when we were first talking to them, um, I was really, because, you know, I don't really work with that many people because I just, you know, I just don't want to really kind of, um, I just have limited time. So and going through the interview with them and kind of really asking them a lot of questions, I just like their heart. You know, Matthew, the owner, is just a real great guy. And I just really like their heart. And then I met Rachel, and it's just been it's been great ever since. I sit on the board of directors of Park University. Right. Um, uh, my university, actually, I'm doing a commencement speech in a couple of weeks. And I learned a lot about higher education. I have three children, as everyone knows, that have – that are all in college. So I'm learning from that, from a parent's perspective. And then from a technology perspective, I learned a lot from Matthew and Rachel at Faro. So mm -hmm. I thought there's a lot of similarities between the hotel business and what they do for higher education Interesting. and how you keep connected to your guest or to your student. So I wanted to have them on. So with your permission, Glenn, let's have them on. Uh, yes, you, your permission has been uh, granted. Let's do it. Rachel Phillips Buck, welcome to No Vacancy Live. We Good morning. I am so here. pleased to be here. Hey, so exciting to see you and uh, to be our guinea pig today and our, our brand new <laughs> setup over here. I have to say, I'm pretty jealous that you guys are someplace other than your house. Um, yes. And I was <laughs> a little crazy. So uh, I said, let's go on the road. So we went on the road. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, it was exhausting. I had to go something like 35 minutes in a car oh to get my goodness this these are the hardships that we've gotten used to right <laughs> so, so rachel um i'm going to ask you to tell people about your background about the company about pharaohs and then how it relates to the hotel business because it's i think it's really important listen there's nothing more important than getting kids through this experience um i mean your your company was important before now it's critical so i want you to explain that but before i do that i want you to Guess a number. Guess a number from one to twenty. It's something me and Rachel do sometimes. So we're gonna uh, guess a number. I'm gonna send the number. Um, Glenn. Yes. All right. I got it. Uh huh. Uh huh. One to twenty. Go. Okay. Um. Seventeen. Fourteen. Rachel, you're you're losing game. Uh, <laughs> I think I've only gotten like one. Here. See you next time. <laughs> so, so, so Rachel, tell us about Pharaohs. Okay. Well, I think it's really important to understand how we came into this business. Um, I was an at-risk college student. So I was a Yankee. I grew up in New York City and I went to college in Texas. Oh my. Okay. Just so you know, if you grew up in New York City, 
You're the only person to ever grow up in New York City and call themselves a Yankee. <laughs> okay. We don't yeah, use that terminology here. No, in New York. Are you talking no about the, uh, I, I learned this when I came to Texas because they all called me Yankees. Brain, right, they brainwashed you. And I thought it was nice. Don't ever I, say that again about yourself. I was allowed. like, that's really, think I am from the Northeast. And then I found out they did not mean it as a compliment. Right. What they meant was you're cooler than them and they're jealous. That's what exactly. They meant. Exactly. Hey, you really want to be insulted. At least they didn't call you a Mets fan. That's <laughs> That I is true. a lot. It's not, it's not going too so, good for my ego. So let's talk about Fallows. Okay. So I was an at-risk college student, came to Texas to go to school and did not do, I got a 4.0 my first semester, but then I didn't do great after that. And I was really, it was difficult for me because I felt like no one saw me on campus. There was nobody who was like, hey, why aren't you going to classes? Or I'm concerned or is everything okay? Until I had one professor who I didn't show up for his uh, final. Mm. And he called my parents and he said, I don't know what's going on with Rachel, but something is wrong. And my parents were like, hey, what's happening? And then I recovered and then I was a great student. Um, so then I went on to get my counseling degree and uh, my background's marriage and family therapy. So dysfunctional families are pretty interesting to me. And then I had an opportunity to go into business with Matt uh, Boisvert, our president, um, to provide software to higher education institutions. And really what we do is we know that students are holistic and they're not just struggling academically or just struggling socially or mm -hmm. just struggling emotionally. All those things fit together. But in higher education, much like in the hospitality business, you have all of these different silos. So you might have a student who's not showing up to class and they're having trouble with their roommate and their mom is really sick. And if you're not all talking to each other about what's the best way to provide support for this student, then you don't have a cohesive picture of what's happening. So Ferris Resources created software um, that helps uh, a university identify students who are struggling in any way that they are make sure that they are connected, that they have touchstone relationships who can um, pour support into them and help them solve the problems that are happening. And then also do measurements of all of those processes so we know what interventions are working and then what interventions we need to kind of increase and make better. So that's kind of in a nutshell what student success um, and retention is about. I don't know if we've talked about this before, Anthony, but retention and student success is super important to an institution's health because they're so tuition driven that um, the fluctuation in the number of students that they're bringing in in any given semester of one or two or 10 makes a huge difference to their revenue. Um, in addition to the fact that we know students who start college and finish are changing their family tree um, and students who start college and don't finish then not only have the disadvantage of not having a college degree, but also the debt that comes with starting a program and not being able to finish. So it's incredibly important to make sure that students are able to, you know, um, persist through to graduation. Yeah, and what I think is really important about what you do, it really translates to the hotel business because if you're not taking care Wait, of, uh, uh, you can't hear me. No, everything's fine. Uh, basically, if you can't. Uh, know what's going on with your employees right now, especially during COVID, you're laid off, they're furloughed. And if you don't really connect to them and you don't keep an open communication, that's a problem. That's and exactly right. And somewhere else, instead of keeping that connection. So I think there's nothing more important that we can do. And every one of us that has a college age student about to go to college, um, need something like this to make sure the university is connecting to our children. You know, we're a close family, and so I, I'm connected to my kids, but I don't know everything. I don't know, like, my, if my kid missed the final or, or is screwing up until I get a report card, and then, you know, I got to go search for too it late. to make sure I get it, so it's too late. So I think it, it really has a lot of similarities to how you should kind of keep in touch with your employees in the hotel business. What are you seeing? Well, how do you feel that most hotels are doing right now during COVID communicating with their uh, students? Um, so most colleges and universities have students um, either on campus, but doing online classes, or they're having in-person classes, but they're shrinking down the size of classes because they don't want large groups of people um, in one place at one time. So I think it's a mixed bag for schools. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think that if you didn't start in person this fall, your students are all at home. We saw in March a really big uptick in mental health issues if students were staying home because they have not only this academic issue um, of doing online learning, but they don't have space to be able to learn. They have internet problems. They have food insecurity. They have, you know, five or six people in one house trying to all do education. And so trying to figure out how to communicate to those groups of students when they're not on your campus is really, really difficult. We partnered with Macmillan Learning to do a survey so that we could figure out for each of our schools that we're serving, who are the students that need financial support? How can we help them with those food insecurities and that sort of thing? Really, um, if your students are online, I'll tell you, or on campus, I'll tell you that I think a really big um, shortfall is these schools that are having to keep track of COVID cases and doing um, isolation and quarantine, which they're using our software to keep track of all of those different things and reminders who's in quarantine and who have they been in touch with. But Anthony, when you came on my show, I really appreciated the hospitality um, perspective to say, I think you said every president for every university should be calling those students who are in quarantine or isolation every week to check and see how they're doing. Our schools took your advice and started doing that. Oh, cool. um, you know, yeah, you talked about feeding them really well if they were in quarantine, because what we saw a lot of times was when a student got a, a positive test, they were kind of bundled up and taken somewhere um, so that they would do quarantine. They didn't have any of their stuff. They didn't have a means to feed themselves. And they went into solitary confinement. If you look at NYU, yeah. the first time they were doing with NYU, they um, didn't give them good food. They gave them processed foods. That's right. They were they would get like a box full of a couple bags of chips and a granola bar. And that was supposed to last them all day. Right. And you were like, no, you have to feed. One of the ways that you can care for these students is you have to start feeding them good food. So they feel really supported and connected because that's what we're trying to do. We don't just want to communicate um, the, the points like, Hey, you're in quarantine for the next two weeks and this is what you have to do. But we want to, show them hospitality and be connected to them and say, we see you and this is really difficult for you. Um, so I, I think schools have to be very, very intentional about communicating their value to students um, beyond just, uh, we want you to start taking online classes. Yeah, I like what you're, you're, you're saying there that it's kind of connected to the, the whole notion of them trying to make more money. I remember when I was in college, that first class I had one of those giant lecture halls with hundreds of people in, in it. And the teacher was like, uh, take a look to your left, take a look to your right. You know, one of those students will not be here at the end of this, uh, this semester. And I felt like that was their, their duty of care at that point, just to warn you, they did nothing else in regard to that. I happen to have been a student that was horrific all around, but my first semester in college was uh, was just a joke. I like to think about it as, uh, at least I set the bar really low so I wouldn't have to excel too much to, to appreciate everyone after that, but I didn't have any resources. To, to help make my life better. In my first year of college, I was dealing with the separation of being home for the first meaningful time in my life, as well as the death of not one, but two grandparents and some other personal issues that were going on. And I probably could have used a support system. It's a surprise that I even stuck with it when I knew that there were other kids that were going through things and then they just gave up. So how does this actually help um, educators understand what's going on in a student's life to be able to connect with them in a more meaningful way to bring them back from that precipice or at least to help them uh, excel under normal circumstances. See, Rachel, I told you he was smart. He has yeah, that is such a good, what you said is exactly right. Because here's the thing, Glenn, if nobody knew what was going on with you, then what your faculty assumed is that it was an academic issue. Right. Right. Like we don't know why he's not doing well. He's not coming to classes. He's not doing his homework or he's not whatever that looked like in terms of academics. And I'll say on a campus, there are such um, significant silos. There's the academic side of the house, which is faculty and tutoring and first year programs and that sort of thing. And then on the other side of the house, you have student life, which is like activities and residence life and um, all of those kind of fun things about school. So your teachers, Glenn, might have been like, Glenn, you need to start going to tutoring. 
Right. Well, you don't need to go to tutoring because you're already overwhelmed and right. you feel like I don't have any resources. Right. Um, on the other side, we might have somebody in your res life um, area who knows you well and knows what's going on with you. Who's like, hey, can we talk about what's happening? But you're failing your class. So somehow we have to have this combination. And so what we do is we're able to identify multiple people on a campus who would have we talk about it in terms of a piece of the puzzle. So maybe just you not going to class does not mean we've got to like get this whole team to try to help support you, right? But it is a piece of the puzzle that if we identify in light of all of these other pieces, then we can have a realistic strategy to make sure that you are getting the kind of support that you need. So um, we just have so many processes. We, we talk about it in terms of people, processes, and, and uh, technology. There are so many dysfunctional processes and technology on um, college campuses. And I would assume in the hospitality business, too, that, that part of what we have to do is get those straightened out so that we can see a student wholly. Right. Yeah, it sounds like this is the essence of hospitality, Anthony, because you're really empowering people throughout something like this to to deal with any issues that they have to give them a way to the uh, the light to you know make further progress in whatever they're up to you know and growing up in this industry it was kind of like growing up when i was playing baseball it's we care about your performance we don't really care about anything else so i was probably very guilty of that being a young manager or even as i got older in my career it's like if you're having problems that are helping you, hurting you from performing, please tell me and I'll fix them. If not, I expect you to show up and I expect you to do your job. And, you know, if, I always said if you, if you want to call in sick, don't. And uh, God forbid you die, give me two weeks notice. <laughs> so, so I was that kind of manager for a long time. Whereas I would like, again, you tell me you need help. I'm the first person up and I'm going to help you and do whatever. I'm going to clean your car. I'm going to take care of kids. I'm going to give you money, whatever you need. But I'm not going to go out of my way to find out really how are you. That's not who I was as a manager early on. And one of the things that John, one of our favorite um, watchers, is, asked the question was, um, he asked, we have a lot of students that work on our team. How can we look for science and help? I was not great at that. Again, your work performance is suffering. I'll ask you, are you okay? Do you need anything? But that was kind of like old school. Like yeah. what do I do to get in front of that? So two things I'll say. The first one is I find a lot of times that we're thinking about students who we expect to have some self-agency to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm really struggling, right? Because right. um, when you're 18, that's really what you're focused on. <laughs> right, exactly. And also, I, I think sometimes we underestimate the shame. There's a lot of shame for college students who are really feeling overwhelmed and struggling and them going somewhere. In fact, when I was a terrible college student, I told my mom and she said, I want you to go talk to the vice uh, president. He's our friend. And so I went and he said, how are you? And I said, I'm great. And he said, how are classes? And I said, they're, they're great. I love it here. It's wonderful. And then I went back home and my mom was like, how'd it go? And I said, well, I lied to him because I don't want him to know. It's embarrassing to, to feel like you're not doing a good job, right? So- right. That self-agency, I think, is really, really hard. We're develop developing it in these young adults, but they do not have it. They're not going to come to you and say, hey, this is something that's happening o overall. Um, so I would just say students are not okay. I would just make that assumption across the board. They are not okay. If they're at home, they're really struggling um, with a lot of different issues. But I'll tell you, even if they came back to campus, their experience of being masks and wearing and uh, wearing masks and being on Zoom and not being able to eat with each other and not being able to socialize with each other and go to activities and everything that you think is the best part of college, they are feeling very isolated, very overwhelmed. And what's hard about it, I think, as adults is we can't fix it. That it, that's just the way that it is right now, right? So I think talking to them and saying, hey, I know that this is really difficult is helpful to them. Um, and just, I mean, I, their resiliency in the middle of this is, has been amazing to me. I know, Anthony, you're saying this about your daughters. Like, yeah, I don't know how you're managing this. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's tough on all of them. Um, I, I have, my daughter came home for a couple of days and she was telling me how her friends are struggling. And like everybody was fine in the beginning, it was new and everything. And now they're like, they're bored. And someone asked a question, Steve yeah, I asked got a question, it right here. pull it up. Why don't you read that? I think that's yeah, a great my question. College I, age. Hold on one second. I'd like to really get your perspective, Rachel, on this, because I had a different 
perspective on this until I read this question. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they shouldn't be on camera. So, so that has to yeah, it's inter it's interesting you say that because my son, one of my two sons who are in eleventh grade right now, is saying exactly the same thing. Let me bring that back up so I can read it. My college age child speaks of how physically and mentally fatigued she gets after a ninety minute online class. My kids are seeing that too, sitting in front of a computer the whole day, having the video on a uh, requirement of the professor is adding a layer of overhead. Any strategies to reevaluate the on camera aspects of online classes? It's so hard. We have enough. We have a hard enough time here trying to look like we're smiling and stuff like that. Right. Anthony's not and, good at that. And, and, when he's and, not talking. And, and what's, in, what's interesting? Yeah, I'm not. I look like I'm pissed off when I'm yeah. doing that. But what's interesting? What's interesting is um, we go in and out on the camera, and we put the camera on the the um, guest a lot, and we do that for a number of reasons. One, because we want to give you complete like yeah, comp camera, but also it gives us an opportunity to have some water to maybe not worry about my face. And just kind of lets me relax a little bit. And if I want to look at an email real quick, if I, something came in, like it just gives me a moment where it doesn't like sometimes I'll grab my phone as you're talking. I'm like this and I don't like that. But sometimes I need to take that um, because it's, it's something related to what we're doing. So I so I really thought and I even told my kids that I like that you have to be on screen. I, I, it's ridiculous if you're not on screen. Um, but now just in the way he asked that question, I'm second guessing that. Okay, so two things I want to say about that. First is active listening and attending is exhausting, right? So exactly like you're saying, when we're looking at the camera and we're nodding and we're smiling and we're paying attention, we very rarely in real life sit across from a person and look at their face and smile and nod most of the time. We're, when we're talking before COVID, we're sitting in a room together, we're looking at our notes, we're looking elsewhere. So the idea that you are just sitting and staring into someone's eyes and having to attend to everything they say is very unnatural and it is a lot of work. I'll tell you as a counselor, that is a lot of work. That's why we do it for 50 minutes and then we've got to take a break because attending to everything a person is saying when you, the camera is on your face like this is really, really exhausting. Um, I think especially for extroverts because it is not the same as being in a room together and getting energy from each other, right? It is really like sitting still, staring and having to nod. Um, if you look at me this morning and Glenn was like, are you on those uh, athletic greens again? <laughs> these, this, this, these things that I eat in the morning. And I was like, no, I'm not. And he goes, why? I said, I just need a plane ticket with my name in it. Like I am like, I'm anti. Everybody's like, they're like, you know, a COVID fatigue. And I hate to say that because I think that's a wrong uh, right. headset to have. I don't want to have that headset, but I will tell you, it is grinding on me. I, I mean, I'll sit, I, I sit with my clients sometimes all day long. I'm on meetings all day long, yeah. looking in the camera, trying to solve their problems. And I love it. And I love my clients, but I literally rip my jacket off and run out, right. you know, run out to my yard <laughs> and I'll get on the treadmill, the, uh, the bike, or I'll do push ups, or I'll just sit there and I go, nobody bother me. And so I can imagine not having the experience I have, the, the, the mental strength I have when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, you know, I was different a little bit than you guys is I did really bad in high school because I had all kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, but in college, I was, I was a great student, believe it or not. I did really, really well, but I was in the air force. So I didn't want to get in trouble. Right. And I didn't want people to look down at me. Like you said, there's a lot of shame, but I focused really hard in, in, in college. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of uh, other stuff going on. Um, but if I had to sit, I remember I took one class on tape about, um, uh, not not Russian history. It was um, I don't know some kind of history class. I wanted to stab myself in the eye with my pen <laughs> every day. I would go down to this little hallway into this little classroom by myself, put these big things on, look at the thing, and listen to somebody talk. And I wanted to take a pen and stab myself in the face. Yes, I can totally understand that. The other thing I want to say about online classes is we are seeing a shift away from professors asking students to share their camera okay. because not only is it exhausting for them, but it can reveal things about their surroundings mm -hmm. and their life that they don't want to reveal. So you think about one of the equalizers of going to college right. is that we all have the same space. We're all studying in the library. We all have a, a res hall. We have the same internet. We have the same environment. And so we just equalize that. 
if you come from a background where you don't have a lot of money or there's something about your house or your environment that you feel embarrassed about, the nice thing for you when you go to college is when you step in the classroom, all of that is gone. All they know about you is I've come to this class. I'm enrolled in this school. I, I'm smart. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to do my work. And it's been equalized. And what we're finding when we're asking students to share cameras is that some of them are feeling like it's revealing things about them that they don't want everyone to know. And that might change the way that people think about them. And that can be really talk about shame and feeling right. embarrassed. And you can't fix it because if that's where you are, there's nothing to be done about it when your faculty says you have to share your camera. So I think we've made a little bit of a shift away from that kind of being mandatory, I think, for both those reasons. Right. I can understand why they went down that direction, because they want people to be paying attention and it's all new and they that seems the most obvious solution. But sometimes in society, the things that are the most obvious aren't the most correct. Right. Yeah. So it's a learning process. So it's good to see that, that that folks are learning. What can what do you think students can do to try to help get their positioning understood more so that uh, faculty and deans and stuff like that can come more to their to their side. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because in higher education, we talk all the time about student development, about this is the, the work of higher education. We have the academic side and then we have the student development side. And so I think part of what we have to do is we have to model, we have to explain, this is how you can advocate for yourself. Um, this is how you can talk to faculty about, I would rather not, and here are the reasons why. Um, using that as a learning um, opportunity. And I'll tell you, I mean, you would be surprised at the kinds of steps that you have to take to teach a, a student the appropriate way to make a, a, um, a ask of a faculty member, right? So we're gonna practice. Tell me what you're gonna say, be respectful, lay out the reasons, right? All of those things are part of developing into a young adult. And so I think it's helpful to use those as learning processes so that they can get that self agency, right? That we were talking about. Anthony, I can't hear you. Now try it. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just learned something um, about this computer. I hit mute to me, but apparently it muted everybody. So <laughs> I apologize. So, so um, my daughter, um, <laughs> excuse me, uh, executive team on her college had a meeting with students and they asked, what can we do better? And there were things that they can do better. Excuse me. Um, take some more. All right. While we're doing that, this is a, this is a surprising. Steve said uh, one of his child's professors decided uh, online class is just too hard. So they videotaped lectures to the students to watch each class period and then offered office hours once a week for actual student interaction. Quite disappointing to see that. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a flip of the classroom, which I think a lot of people are doing, which is where they're recording their lectures. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of having a recorded lecture, but then coming together to spend time together in meaningful interaction. Right. Um, because, yeah, exactly. Because that's really, I mean, anybody can listen to a lecture, but when we spend time together to be able to say, what questions do you have? Can I explain this better? Can we talk about this more? That's really interesting for the, for the teacher. I mean, yeah, we have to go through every single one again, but I, I think that's important. So anyway, so I, I like our format here They, you know, people interact with us in real time. It's the same thing as a classroom. We're doing essentially the same type of, of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I really like when you interrupt me right in the middle of a sentence. Hey, me too. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, when someone, okay, use a sound effect. Go ahead, David. I know you want to. <laughs> so, so uh, that's right. We got new sound effects. Yeah. I told them once a week we can use a sound effect. Any more than that, unacceptable. Um, this is where you when I, put say, on the booth when I say something funny, I want you to hit the funny button. What's the funny you button? Have to be on board. You won't have to find that one if Anthony's talking. <laughs> so, so my, um, what the hell was I saying? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> so no, but, but the, yeah, the, students, the students were asking questions and they said, I won't tell you what, because I don't want my kids to say that I'm talking at the school, but uh, no pun intended that this isn't working for us because you're letting us do this and but you're not letting us do that and that doesn't make any sense because it's the same thing and you know but you can't do it you can't like have you know x amount of people in a room but you can have you know x amount of people you know hanging out in, in the cafeteria whatever it is and um and, and they listened 
And I think that's so important because what happens is you saw an empowerment of, of the, that kid or my, my, my daughter saying what they listen to us. And whether they, they make a complete change or not, that they were listening. And there were other professors um, advocating uh, for change as well on the call. So you heard other professors advocating on behalf of the students in front of the students. And I think that that takes a lot of courage from the executive team to allow that kind of discussion to happen. And I think it's critical. But you can see that you have a point of view that people are listening to. And one of the things that I found really empowering when I was running, we can see your lips moving, Glenn, and your whole facial expression. Sorry. So you know. Hold on one second. Let me do this. <laughs> That's good. And, and um, when you when you empower people and say, hey, you may see me and my general manager or me and my assistant manager disagreeing on something, and that's okay, in front of the, the, the employee, you don't have to do it negatively. But if I say, no, I disagree with you, I think Susie's right, and I apologize for saying it in front of Susie, but this situation is serious, and I agree with Susie, that's empowering. As long as you're not undermining anybody, that's an empowering thing. So as a student talking to faculty and the, and the, and the executive team, all uh, hashing it out. Because what happens when we first started this in the beginning of the year, it's like, okay, this is our plan. Here you go. There was, no, there was not a lot of time for everybody's input. Teachers, you know, uh, parents, students. It was like, this is what the executive team said, and this is what we're going to do. And now, hopefully, at least through a couple of colleges that I'm seeing, that people are more like, okay, how do we do? What are we going to do better for the second semester? Yeah. Listen, we're going to be like this until September. Uh oh, what happened? Okay. Nothing. Okay. Sorry. I think she thought she was muted, but she was not. Okay. So, so I think. Listen, we're uh, we're going we're going to stay online until September. Is that correct? Basically. Yeah. So let me tell you what I think uh, the trends are for schools because that, this actually I would be really interested to hear the hospitality uh, industry's response to what's going to happen on colleges uh, over the next couple of months. So most schools are sending their students home right. for Thanksgiving. Um, they are either yeah. finishing classes or they are going to move them to online. So they're going to send them home for Thanksgiving. They're not going to come back until the beginning of their spring semester. And many of the schools that I'm talking to are actually delaying openings until February. So go to schools opening February 13th. Yeah. So that way they'll get rid of some of the other breaks. Then nobody has to leave. The That's Iraq. exactly right. So they'll send them home that whole time. Wow. The other thing that I hate to tell you is that I think a lot of schools are canceling spring break. So they're not going to let students go somewhere that's, for spring break. My daughter's school canceled already. Wow, that's really uh, that's really bad smart. news for the it hospitality business. It, 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 it's it's, terrible it's the right thing to do health wise. It's for the hospitality business. Yeah, I yeah. That. especially yeah. considering last uh, March um, when everyone was uh, partying and not caring at all that this was going across the country. Very rough wow. choice. So I'm wondering, I was thinking about kind of, there's so many possibilities for hospitality to partner with higher education. I have schools that are partnering with hotels to do their quarantine and isolation because the similarities um, for what higher education has to provide, right? They have to feed you and they have to house you and they have to give you internet and they have to give you space and all of those things that hotels do really, really well. So we have schools that are partnering with hotels who are then doing their quarantine and isolation for them. We also have schools that are partnering with hospitality uh, industry to increase the number of students that they can have on ground because they're moving to single residencies. So they can't now have two in every room. So they've got all of these students that they don't have, have housing for. So we have schools that are signing contracts with hotels saying, hey, can you please take these students and the hotels are it. Um, so just thinking about this whole population of families that between November and February are going to be home together. Again, they've already done that. It's really difficult and people get sick of being in the same space together. So I don't know how the hospitality industry could answer that for those families. Um, and I also will say higher education professionals who are used to having a little bit of a break during the summer. Mm -hmm. have not had that this summer because they've had to work right. so hard. They are exhausted. They need to go on a vacation. So I just think pitching that kind of idea to higher education professionals, they are wrung out and tired in a way that I have not seen before um, in higher education. 
Right. I would like to say that my family thinks that every day they're with me at home, stuck in the house, is a blessing. So I don't know about all you other families <laughs> out there, but hanging out with me is is a pure pure delight. But Rich, I you know you're right. You're absolutely uh, right about everything you're you're saying. We haven't been thinking about these issues uh, uh, enough. So uh, what's the best way to um, reach out to the, uh, the the college campuses and say, hey, take a vacation, teachers. You've been you've been exhausted. You know? Yeah. I would do that through human resources. I would just go to them and say, hey, we want to partner with you guys. We want to create a package for your um, for your people because human resources will be connected both to the academic and the student development side of the house. I think they would be so grateful and really interested in just, even if it's just a day and a night, right. go and be by yourself, spend some time just recuperating because they are not, they have not stopped. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Anthony, did you want to say something? No, I just keep messing with that. I can put that on the screen now because I have the computer. Yeah, there, uh, Risa. Yes, uh, this is uh, this is a lot of fun. We've empowered Anthony <laughs> a little too much. I'm uh, a little worried about it. Oh, it Anyone wondering if I'm looking that way? It's because he's actually about ten feet from me. <laughs> What's funny is uh, the producer couldn't figure out who was putting that on the screen, so I was enjoying doing it for a few minutes. Oh, that's right. You're the first. That's the first time you've ever been doing that with uh, yeah. with us. We've given him too much control. So are there resources, um, techniques from universities that have been offering online courses? In the past, ask our friend of the show, um, Mike McManus. He says he has a high school student uh, taking college courses online. College cl classes seem light years ahead of his high school classes as well. Yeah, I, that's a really interesting question to me because I will tell you that online classes in terms of college were usually designed for groups of students who had to be very, very flexible. So they were like non-traditional students, students who were working. Right. So they had to have a lot of flexibility. So kind of everything we know about online classes was designed for that population. Well, the students you sent home in March are not that population. They actually, what we're hearing from them in terms of mental health is they need to have a schedule. They need to have to show up at a certain time in a certain place. They need a lot more structure than those online classes were kind of originally designed for that population. So there are ways that you can do online classes in a better um, kind of format for students. But I would say a lot of what we know about online classes was designed for a completely different population than is, is taking them now. Right. Uh, yeah. And listen, the, the number one thing to understand, with, the thing that kind of bothered me a little bit, you can still see your first expression plan. One of the things- I'm just responding to uh, David. He's got some pressing issues over there. One of the things that really bothers me is that everybody's blaming, right? You know, the schools aren't doing well. It's the American the, way. The parents, the parents are, you know, not doing well. The kids are lazy. The kids aren't doing well. That is, that is not true. The kids want to, a dynamic uh, environment. They want to learn. I know my kids want to learn, but they also want to feel like college students. It's like, no, we go to college and now we have separation from our parents. And now we're allowed to go do things. And it's your rite of passage for doing well for 12 years. I wanted my kids to go and have fun. And then my daughter, you know, her freshman year, she, you know, she's on the volleyball team and that's good and everything. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, it fits in stuff. It's like, okay, they can play. Now they can't now they can play. They can't because some kids weren't, you know, there, there were some issues. But now they're back on. And that's not the environment. And one of the things we're learning is kids are resilient. Everyone's kind of getting through it, but everybody's got this fatigue. And, but there's nobody to blame. Like there's no one like from a professor or the school, unless there was one school I won't name uh, that did it horribly. They didn't test anyone. And they, they shut down the school. 700 students got sick almost immediately. And the, and the principal, the president is no longer in that school. She basically left or got fired. And how do you let kids come to school and nobody's got to get tested? So outside of that, everybody's doing their best. That's right. And back to what you said earlier about listening to people. So I'm seeing a lot of frustration and anger from faculty about students, what, what they're perceiving as a student's lack of application of themselves, like not doing their best work, you know, and, and faculty are feeling mad about it. And I think you have to listen to your students and right. just say, how is this going for you? So that they can say really badly, it's really awful. I'm exhausted at the end of 90 minutes of staring at your face. And then I've got to do it again three more times today, right? So I think we I should- what's wrong is, Not to interrupt, what's wrong is, and as a parent, 
I'm thinking, well, you're just choosing that as an excuse, right? Until we just talked today, I didn't realize that I'm like, I don't really get involved. So I'm not like with them. I said, like, just do your best. And so if they need me, I'm there, but I'm not like judging them. If they're on camera, not on camera, if they're doing their work, not doing their work, I'm not up there. I'm, not, I'm just leaving them alone. With that said, I was kind of like, hey, why, you know, maybe you should be on camera more. Stop, you know, put your phone down, like concentrate. And again, I, I go out of my way not to, to see what's going on, but I'm sure they're on their phone. But you know what? They got to find their way. At the end of the day, everyone's got to find their way for this to work for them. So if it's shutting off the camera and you're one of those kids that can look at your social media and also study and also listen, everybody's got to find their own path. Yeah, that's exactly right. And sustainability is what we're going for now, right? Like we're right. just trying to keep going. So I got a question. How does this software actually work in the sense that if I'm a disenfranchised student that's not really participating, how does the university figure that out and have the mechanism to understand what's going on in my life and then reach out? Yeah. So there's a couple of indicators that we talk about. We talk about leading indicators, which would be like a first generation college student. We might assume that they're going to need some extra support. Mm -hmm. um, we can do surveys where we ask students, how do you feel about your academic motivation? Those sorts of things. And those would be um, indicators that we're finding students before they show signs of struggle. We can just ask them and get engaged with them really early. We also have lagging indicators. So we're looking at things like um, for online school, are they logging in? Did they look at the syllabus? Are they doing their homework? We also um, are getting referrals. So I have a student in my class and here's what they told me is going on with them. I just wanna make sure that the right people know this is happening so that we can then get that connected team. Right. And the other thing um, that is really important is that you leverage existing relationships. So Glenn, I'm sure when you were in school, you had one or two professionals, administration, faculty, student life that knew you and they were invested in you. If some random person is like, Glenn, how's it going? You're going to say fine. Right. But mm -hmm. if that person that you know and you trust comes to you and says, hey, what's going on with you? I heard right. you're not doing right. super well in math then all of a sudden we have an opportunity to engage those students. Right. So use the word that's really important, invested. Like they're invested in you. There's a difference between saying, how are you? And are you invested in me? And break, break it down. There are some times where I'll, I'll be in a room when I was running hotels and I'm like, come here. And they're like, uh, I said, what's the matter? No, everything's great. I was like, no, what's the matter? And they were like, my mother doesn't know there's something bothering me. But how did you pick that up? Because I'm invested in their success. And that's the difference. And then there's some times where I didn't catch it because I said, how are you doing? They said, I'm doing fine. And I walked away. You know, there's a difference between um, being invested and being, you know, just asking a question. That's right. And it's and it's deeply personal, right? You're When somebody says to you, how are you? You're looking at them trying to figure out, are you saying, how am I? Or are you just saying, how are you? Right. right. And you say you make a decision. You're saying hi. When you say how are you, you're just saying hi. Right. right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So yeah, and, that invested relationship. Well, how many times have you asked somebody how are you and they tell you and you're like, I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> I just meant hi. I just meant hi. <laughs> So, uh, Rachel, I, it was interesting. Um, we, uh, David just had on the scroll below saying that you that this software has helped schools reach their highest retention levels in their history. That's very, yeah, very that. important yeah. business because pre-COVID, we were seeing um, we, we were seeing uh, up to 100, 100 percent or more, you know, people leave throughout the year. And every single time someone leaves, the numbers are an average of four to seven thousand dollars to replace each employee. So retaining them is super important. How could we utilize this in the hospitality realm to help with that retention factor? Well, I will tell you, this, the projections in March were that schools were going to be cutting their budget 20%. Mm -hmm. They were feeling like they were going to be completely overwhelmed. We didn't know if students were going to come back. Mm -hmm. We um, were really worried about the value proposition. So if you're paying an average uh, to go to a private four-year school, $37,000 a year, and you send all of your students home, and it's just as good as if they were on your campus. Schools were really afraid that parents were going to be like, why are we spending this much money? 
if we can just do online classes. So we in March worked super, super hard with our clients to say, you've got to explain to parents and students why they should be connected to your community and continue to come back. And you've got to not just give them the like, here's what's going to happen over the next couple of months, but really invest in saying we are a community. We want to come back together. Here's what we're going to do for you. We miss you. We're longing for the time when we can be back on campus together. And schools worked all since March to to have that communication. They did call campaigns. They did surveys. They continually were saying, hey, give us the tools that we need to be able to keep these students close to us so that they will come back. And the reason we partnered with Anthony is because I am pretty... um, pointed in getting the right tools for our schools. I just am dogged in it. I want to be a great collector of resources. And Anthony's perspective on how you come into something that's broken or that needs to be assessed was super helpful for our schools. So all of those things together, using technology to support and connect students who were online and making sure that we were still giving them what they needed. They worked super hard and we've been so grateful. We've seen um, some schools that are up in retention, which is amazing during COVID. We see a lot of our schools who are right at the same level of their previous retention, which is great. And then one or two schools that are seeing a drop of one or 2%, but nothing like the 20% that we were really afraid of. And one of the things that I wanna mention is, um, I use the word a lot lately, undeniable. And one of the things it comes to mind, Rachel, you're undeniable. You're undeniable when we do our interviews for your for your um, members. You're funny. You're prepared. You know my background. You ask me 20, you know, what is that called? The 20 questions. Like <laughs> another. And you make it very, very entertaining and interesting. And we have this really comfortable, we haven't even met in person, which is unbelievable to me because I feel <laughs> Like you and I grew up together, and and but you made it so comfortable. And like, of all the clients I've worked with, it's like which of the clients I want to continue to work with, and who's undeniable. And you guys have made yourself undeniable, at least in my. I said the other day, I said I want to work with you guys as long as you, you'll have me. And there's something to that because you're invested in me because you're you're not you just don't know the top line stuff about me. You dig and you dig and you dig and then you bring it out and the way you bring it out is for me to help you because I oh I didn't even remember that and that's why I did this and this is how I did that and that's why and all of a sudden now it helps your it helps your team which is great but but you're undeniable you 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 just like you said you're dogged you just keep drilling until people are paying attention until you get the results you want and I think whether it be faculty whether it be hotels is if you want retention if you want to keep those employees You've got to be dogged and caring. And there are some people who are naturally built to sit and talk to somebody for a half hour and really understand. If you're not that person, I'm not I'm not that person when I'm running a hotel, I can't have everybody in my office for a half hour telling me all their issues. I just can't. But you gotta find somebody that's really good at that. With that said, I do that one minute management where I'm talking to people in one minute, I get just as much out of you and get in a half hour. Uh, because I go right right for the juggle and say, Hey man, no, no, I can tell there's something wrong, just tell me. But you have to care. You have to want to care. And um, I think the people are doing it right. And the person that did it wrong in this one school I'm talking about in New York, I personally think her political views got in the way of protecting her students. That's just my opinion. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I, I feel like this, this conversation is coming to an organic conclusion over here, Rachel. Um, how about some final thoughts from you? Unless, Anthony, you've got another question or, or two. Yeah? No? All right, Anthony seems satiated. Okay, well, one thing that I want to tell you is I'm really excited about this idea of hospitality and higher education being able to partner together. Um, I think there's a lot of um, synergy to get around having a property where you're doing a lot of what colleges and universities are doing. Again, feeding, housing, internet, spaces, meeting rooms, all of those things that colleges and universities are doing. Um, but also partnering with them to to help them do that better. And I would say I have this idea about providing student development professionals so that you actually could have a, um, a pod of people taking classes at a hotel online classes from whatever university they choose, but then lending that student development perspective 
-hmm. where we're doing things like career guidance and teaching adulting and doing all of those other things that you're learning while you're in college. So I think there's a lot of um, partnership opportunities there um, for you to be able to kind of connect with higher education uh, in the hospitality business. Absolutely. And you talked about teaching them how to, you know, adulting. I love that terminology, adulting. So can you send the manual over for Glenn to adult? <laughs> no, I will not read it. I refuse. <laughs> yeah, where's where, 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 where's uh, my friend Matthew? Is he anywhere where I can get him on camera real quick? He's here. Yeah. Come over. Come over here, Matthew. Where are you? Share my, share my screen. There he is. What a handsome fella. How are Hi, you, buddy? Hi, Glenn. Hey, great to see you. It's hey, thanks for what you do. Do you have any final words before we uh, let you guys go? No, thank you so much. It's great. Uh, just the opportunity when we think about two industries that were hit really hard with COVID and how you can innovate by coming together, ways that we can learn. You've helped us learn so much. And, and if we can help hospitality learn about some of these uh, opportunities, we'd love to. I think there are a lot of opportunities where, especially like if you look at an A city like New York, colleges want to be in New York. So if we can figure out a hotel that would want to rent out a their college, you have to put it back on. Uh, yeah, we could do that while you're talking. There you go. Uh, how, how you can um, have a college take over a, a hotel, like literally buy out the hotel for, for, for the semester or for the year and really have, now you have a campus in New York or you have a campus in Tampa Bay or wherever you want that campus. And uh, uh, trust me, you find hotel, you find college, uh, college that want to do that. I'll find your hotel that would. I uh, remember graduate hotels is finding some luck yeah. uh, with with that because they're Absolutely. located on or near campuses, and a lot of students that did not return home or had to leave the country, but you know, chose not to leave the country to go home, stayed at their hotels for the semester. Right. Hey, Anthony, I have a great summary uh, summary for you. Are you ready? This I'm, is my uh, this is my new mug that I have been drinking out of. Wait, let me see. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it? It looks, like the middle, it looks like the middle finger. Year. It looks like the middle finger. What am I? It watching? does. Exactly. 2020, such a special year. I. <laughs> this makes me feel joyful every time I drink out of it. I'm like, right. <laughs> well, Rachel, you know I love you, and I will speak to you soon. Okay, sounds right, good. Rachel, right. before we, uh, you got to do a shameless plug. How can we find you guys? Uh, FerrisResources.com. I'd love to talk to you. You can email me directly at Rachel at FerrisResources.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate right, it. Just time with you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Anthony, we made it through. This is so awesome. We did. On that note, I'm going to let, I'll let our producer pick another uh, theme. All right, Dave. Dave, Dave we're going to. Hey, yeah, you can. Um, all right, go for it. We don't need to see you on camera. What's going on? Yeah, we need to. We need to see Dave. Wait, wait. But he's half on camera. I can't hear you. And I have myself on mute. Because yeah, well, that's even you don't want yourself to speak on the show. I know, apparently. No, I was going to say, you know, you guys, th this was a great conversation. And Rachel said a lot of things. And a lot of the conversation was related towards students and universities. But there were a couple of things that really translated to me to hotels where, you know, on a smaller scale, she talked about schools keeping retention levels by reaching out to students and parents. I hope a lot of hotels are still doing that to their BT accounts, making sure even if sales teams are not right. on property, that someone's reaching out to your BT accounts to make Explain sure. people what BT accounts are. So uh, business transient, basically your company travelers, whether it's a, could be a school, could be a medical profession, could be anything. As long as someone is traveling for that business, usually hotels will come to a, what's called a locally negotiated rate so that those travelers stay at that specific hotel. Um, and certainly during COVID, that travel has stopped. And if someone's not reaching out to those companies, you're losing that relationship. And if you are in a comp set and have competitors who are not doing that, this is also a potential time to bring in new business, to establish new relationships and possibly speed up that recovery once you come back. Um, and then second, the second thing that really stood out to me was, you know, in the beginning of the show, you guys are talking about checking in with your students, checking in with your kids, checking in with whoever to make sure they're doing okay. Well, uh, leaders, make sure you're doing that with your teams as well, because as we're talking about online education, as a parent of two, virtual learning is tough on parents as well. Very tough. So if you have a housekeeper who's working and has two kids at home who are doing virtual learning and trying to balance her schedule with her spouse's schedule and her kid's schedule, it, it gets very, very overwhelming very quick. So 
just keep that in mind. Uh, it, it's a lot going on that's outside of the normal job scale of that's really causing a lot of stress. Good job, David. I, yeah, I thank you, David. You. That was that was great. So, uh, Anthony, what a good show today. Once again, why do I keep looking at you? I gotta, I'm, I'm gonna look at you over here instead of over uh, over there. I'm loving that we have this new gear right now. This is uh, this is awesome. So, I want to thank everybody for being here and putting up with our patience as we've been trying to figure out how we're going to do a lot of these. <laughs> Remote events, yes. Uh, let's hear another sound effect, Dave, because we're I'm never going to find the applause one. Uh, green one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's me with every joke. All right, enough sound effects. <laughs> all right, we'll figure that out. All right, everybody, I want to thank you all for uh, watching here. Remember, subscribe to our newsletter. Text the word hotel to six six eight six six. Also, check out NoVacancyNews.com. Please check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, all of the usual suspects. Anthony, on Wednesday, we're going to be coming at you from uh, Big Snow, another big uh, event. I'm looking forward to that one. That should be a lot of fun, right? Yeah, Big Snow is out at the Meadowlands uh, in New Jersey. They're open. There's also a Nickelodeon water park. And so please go out there, support those businesses. It's really important that they stay in business. So we have some activities. Uh, I will be on skis. So you will see me skiing. As a matter of fact, he'll do the show and I'll ski. I will not be on skis. I was originally thinking of going skiing, but we decided that uh, I could not handle the hospitalization. That would happen immediately afterwards. I may go on a roller coaster, though. That should be a lot of fun. Anthony, you're back on Thursday with Hospitality Success. Yeah? I am, 3 o'clock Thursday. Be my partner, Jeremy Pinkerton. In. And uh, yes, and also you can't get on skis because our disability insurance here at No Vacancy will not cover you. <laughs> it's already covering all the disabilities I bring to the show on a daily basis. We don't need any more. Okay, so uh, take us out. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Remember, you've got one life, so blaze on and... Thanks for checking in. And oh, I forgot my tagline. Because <laughs> he, he did uh, that, that, that we're sound here. effect. He did that sound effect. He threw me off. Uh,